Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk today about the wonderful world of stars and stellar evolution. Now, this is a reprisal of a course that many of you might have seen before, a third year stellar astrophysics course. We teach it here in the form of Astro 320. And uh, our goal today is to give you kind of a black box treatment for a set of very wonderful physics. We're really going to go through stars and all their details uh, as they're important to galaxy evolution. We're not going to worry about too much about the why. We're going to treat them much more as these are the outputs and the effects. But to understand how galaxies work, we really have to have a good intuition for what a star is doing. So today, we want to go over that intuition and build it up and talk about this in the context of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, and we'll talk about stellar evolution there. This is all material that is really kind of important context. And if you've seen it before, it should seem familiar. We uh, Nothing very new compared to what we see in Astro 320, just kind of a different take on it. To get started, I want to talk a little bit about what we mean by a star. Now, a star is a self-gravitating object. Uh, it has a bunch of gas in it, uh, and it has typical range from, you know, about a star's mass uh, or a sun's mass, which is about a tenth of a solar mass, 0.08 solar masses, up to an upper limit of about 300 solar masses. And we really don't quite know what the upper limit is because stars at that level are very hard to measure. Uh, the uh, chemical composition is kind of a standard chemical composition for the universe as a whole. Uh, and uh, we typically describe it uh, using the variables x, y, and z. So x is the hydrogen mass fraction. And so that means that in a star, if it has a hydrogen mass fraction of x equals 0.72, that means that 72% of the mass of the star is made up in hydrogen. Uh, the y is a variable for helium, and that's typically 25 or 26 percent. And then the letter big Z is what we like to call metals. Now, chemists hate this. This is not the chemistry definition of metals. It just means anything that is not hydrogen and helium. So an uh, astronomer is perfectly happy describing the metallicity of oxygen in a given system. Uh, and this is typically 0 to 2 percent of the mass of a star. Those are those first two properties are the main things that determine how a star is going to evolve, what its properties are, and ultimately how it's going to end its life. Uh, related, less important, but still important for addressing those questions, uh, we have the question of whether a star is found in a binary or a multiple star system, or whether it has a lot of initial angular momentum or spin. And these latter two points here, they're a little less important from the perspective of what makes a star a star, uh, but they are still important in shaping evolution uh, of those stars. Now. When we talk about a star, we often think about our sun as a good point of reference, and we'll usually divide the uh, star up into some basic parts here. Uh, they're, because they're self-gravitating and they are so heavily dominated by gravitation, these are spherical objects. I like to say that gravity is a round force. It has no preferred direction. And so things that are strongly gravitating without other physics going on in them end up as round objects. They're uh, generating energy through nuclear fusion. Uh, that's the fusion typically of hydrogen into helium, which is exothermic. It releases a bunch of energy. Uh, but stars can produce energy through other fusion reactions, and they may not, in some cases, be producing energy at all. If a star is not producing energy, it's going to cool off and something is going to happen because it's this big, hot uh, object in the middle of space. The core of the star is where that fusion energy generation happens. So we will often talk about the stellar core. And so it's there's the center of the star. This diagram is extremely not to scale, uh, showing things off here. 
and uh, the core, you know, is relatively small nuclear fusion energy at the center. And in our star, it is surrounded by what we call the radiative zone, where light is moving outward through a process of radiative diffusion, essentially leaking outward through the star. And then above that is something that we call the convective zone, which is where energy transport is being carried out by convection. So material is hot at the bottom of the convection zone. It kind of boils up to the top, cool off and drops down and this kind of uh, relay carries energy out of the star. And the very surface of the star is the only thing we see. It is the photosphere of the star. We just uh, can't see into the star because it has a really high opacity. And that is basically the boundary where light goes from moving slowly through the star to picking up speed and going at the speed of light through space. Photosphere is kind of that boundary. And in stars, it's a relatively, relatively thin transition zone. The basic physics of stars is governed by the balance between self-gravitation and what we call the pressure gradient. So pressure in and of itself is uh, what we call also isotropic. And so if a gas has pressure, it kind of pushes in all directions. The only thing that can fight against gravity, which is pulling everything to the center of the star, is if there's a difference in pressures. And so if we have a high pressure in the middle and a low pressure on the outside of the star, that leads to a pressure gradient. And that difference in pressures keeps the star supported. It's the balance between pressure and gravity essentially describes the entire physics of how a star plays out. And we, basic, we can do a simple derivation, as is laid out in your book, to argue that in order to not collapse, a star must provide a central pressure P that is of order to, it's what the squiggle is, G times the mass of the star squared over the radius of the star to the fourth power. So G m squared over r to the fourth. And that gas pressure has to be provided by something. And typically in stars, we'll provide it by gas, radiation, or degeneracy pressure. And these are all forms of pressure that arise from different states. And they have different what we call equations of state, which is how you take the state variables of the system, uh, such as the density and the temperature, and turn it into a calculation of the pressure. And so you're probably familiar with a uh, perfect gas law. You might have seen like PV equals nRT in chemistry. In physics, we tend to prefer P equals n kt, where this is the Boltzmann constant. And here the little n isn't the number of small furry creatures like moles uh, in the system. It is instead the volume density of particles. Uh, so more particles per unit volume, higher density. Uh, so that's the pressure is n k t is the temperature. The radiation pressure is what happens when the light itself and the photon pressure uh, from object uh, photons bouncing off of objects and recoiling away. That radiation pressure is has a form of four thirds uh, Stefan Boltzmann constant sigma S B temperature of the fourth over C. So it has a much stronger temperature scaling compared to the gas pressure. And this is the Stefan Boltzmann constant that we know and love, or at least we know. And then the degeneracy pressure is uh, given by this formula here, where K is a constant. It's listed in your textbook. It's actually a combination of a lot of different physical constants and some solutions to differential equations. Uh, that are packed in here. And then this is times uh, rho uh, to the 5 thirds. And here rho is to be contrasted with n as the mass density of the system, and little n is the volume density. So all three of these things are ways where we can uh, provide some pressure. And so that pressure, especially the ones that are common in uh, regular stars, uh, comes from the temperature. So stars have to be hot uh, to provide pressure because they've got all this uh, uh, gravitation pulling them down. And so they have this requisite gm squared over r to the fourth pressure that's required to keep the star supported. And so they need to stay hot and they need to stay hot in the middle of a very cold environment. So that means they must be producing energy. Uh, the exception is if you're supported by degeneracy pressure, you are going to cool off 
But the degeneracy pressure only shows up uh, here through the uh, presence of matter. And so this gives you a balance that doesn't depend on temperature and everything. So if you're supported by the gas or radiation pressure, need to provide some energy input, degeneracy pressure doesn't. Now, degeneracy pressure is a really weird little uh, pressure source. It's actually from quantum mechanics, and it shows up in this rule that basically says that if we were able to not have the pressure, if we were able to compress the matter more, uh, that would violate the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that uh, particles like electrons and protons cannot be in the same quantum mechanical state. And if you push them too close together, they would go into the same uh, quantum mechanical state. And so the Pauli uh, exclusion principle prevents that. And that, through some really, truly glorious physics, uh, turns into a pressure. This quantum mechanical system is what supports um, some of our stellar remnants, like white dwarfs and neutron stars, and we'll talk about that a little later. Anyways, the big question that uh, might have been prompted uh, is, where is the energy of a star coming from? Now, we already mentioned that it's produced by the nuclear fusion, typically of hydrogen into helium, but stars can use all kinds of nuclear fuel sources to produce their energy and allow them to uh, get uh, energy out, heat up their interiors, and stay warm, and therefore not collapse. So the uh, key part of stellar uh, physics is actually understanding how much energy a star can have, how much fuel is present in the star that is going to prevent it from collapsing into the star. And the key to that is shown in this diagram here. This is a plot of the nuclear binding energy per nucleon uh, I'll explain that in a little bit, uh, as a function of the mass number of an element. And you can see the data here are different isotopes of uh, various atoms. And so this 16 oxygen up here, 16 O, uh, that point is saying that that's oxygen with an atomic mass of about 16 or with 16 nucleons in it. And nucleons include protons and neutrons. Uh, if you look on the periodic table, you see that the atomic number of oxygen is eight. And so this just means oxygen with eight protons and eight neutrons to add up to 16 total nucleons. And this little curve here is showing you the amount of energy that each of those uh, nucleons is uh, bound to each other with. And so the key point here is like self-gravitational binding energy, this is the amount of energy that we need to stick into the system to break it apart. Or, because of the laws of conservation of energy, if we assemble this nucleus through the process of nuclear fusion, what's going to happen is that we're going to get that much energy out per nucleon. So if we have helium here, that means that in total it is really, and there's four nucleons brought together, that means that we would have to take uh, seven mega electron volts per nucleon times four nucleons and give you 28 mega electron volts of energy to break up a helium nucleus. Now let's pay attention to the curve next. If you look at this curve, it goes up and it has a sort of overall shape where as you're increasing in atomic mass number for a while, this rises up and it reaches a point where it has a local maximum at 56 iron. And if we increase and we do nuclear fusion to build up atomic mass, then we're going to be increasing the binding energy per nucleon. And what that does is it releases energy. So this is our source of nuclear fusion. But once we reach 56 iron, can't do that anymore. Nuclear physics says that they actually have to put energy in to build up heavier and heavier nuclei like these. But it does mean that we can break up those nuclei and turn them into lighter nuclei and get energy out. And that's what we do with nuclear fusion in a nuclear power plant. We break up our uh, uranium into things like tin and krypton, and that releases a little bit of energy, like half or 0.75 mega electron volts per nucleon. But 
Uh, I guess the other thing that we should pay attention to here is that there are some spikes on this curve on the way up. In particular, the strong nuclear force has kind of magic numbers in it. And those magic numbers uh, say that uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear particles with nucleon number divisible by four are exceptionally stable. So 56 is a number. And then these little spikes here are 16 oxygen, 12 carbon, four helium. Neon is slightly uh, stable relative there, uh, or 20 neon, I should say. So those particles going up, those are the things that are energetically favorable to form. So we get nuclei, uh, extra energy, and so things tend to settle into those. And that's going to be important because these are the elements that tend to be produced through the process of nuclear fusion. Okay, so we have this nice binding energy per nucleon curve, and we're using that to extract energy for a star. I might ask, how is energy going to be, uh, you know, how much energy can we actually get out of this process? The answer is a lot. So if we look at a example here, I could ask the question like this, what's the amount of energy that would be created by fusing hydrogen into helium at the center of the sun. Assume that the core of the sun, that is the amount of fuel that is accessible for nuclear fusion, is a thirteenth of or thirteen hundredths of a solar mass. And this is our uh, chemical composition for the gas in the sun. So let's hop on over here and uh, break this down a little bit. Okay, uh, essentially, we want to go in and we look at the curve and we're starting out here with hydrogen, plain hydrogen. And hydrogen has no binding energy. It's not bound into a nucleus at all. We want to go up to here to where helium is. And so that goes from zero to seven mega electron volts. So every nucleon in the core, when it gets bound up into helium, will release seven mega electron volts. And so the total amount of energy available in the star, call that delta E from nuclear fusion, is going to be equal to this seven mega electron volts per nucleon times the number of nucleons that are available. So times n nuke. And then we can write the seven MeV per nucleon we have to estimate the number of nucleons there in the center of the sun. Now, of, the, of these, the thing we actually care about is the hydrogen. This helium and the metals, they've already fused in one form or another. So we can't get energy out of them through hydrogen fusion. So we only want the mass that is available for hydrogen. Fortunately, this is a mass fraction. And so we're going to estimate this using the approximation that one nucleon has the mass of about one hydrogen atom. And that's because there's one nucleon and a hydrogen atom, and the electron doesn't have much mass at all. So we make that approximation. And then we basically say that neutrons and protons have about the same mass for the purposes of this estimate. So then we say that the total number of nucleons is the mass of gas in the core, so the mass of the core, divided by a hydrogen mass. And so the mass that's in the core, 7 MeV per nucleon, times the mass of the core, which is one solar mass, times 0 0.13, and that is the core fraction up here. Yep, so 0.13. And then we're going to multiply uh, that by the chemical composition. So that's the 0 0.72. And so this here is the x from the problem up above. Uh, and then we're going to divide that by a hydrogen mass. And we can stick in some numbers. So 7 MeV times, uh, oh, sorry, this is 1 mH per nucleon, I should be clear, uh, because those will cancel out. So we get 7 MeV times 1.60 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. 19 is a regular EV, and a mega electron volt is a million of those, so it's 1.60 times 10 to the negative 13 joules 
times one solar mass, that's 1.99, times 10 to the 30th kilograms, times 0 0.13, times 0 0.72, and then we divide that by a hydrogen mass, which is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, and then everything cancels out in terms of kilograms. And the answer that we pull out of this analysis is 1.73 times 10 to the 44 joules. So if we go through all of that, we can then multiply that, uh, uh, oh, sorry, let's just uh, leave it as this. We'll come back to that later. So that gives us uh, total amount of energy. I just want to compare that to the reference energy uh, that the solar luminosity is uh, 3.86 times 10 to the 26, I'm oh, sorry, 3.84 times 10 to the 26 watts. And that means so every second we use uh, 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts from the center of the sun, and the total amount of energy available in the bank is 10 to the 44. So that means that we can last a good long time because every second we do this, but then there's a lot of seconds uh, that the sun can do it at this energy. Okay, so that gets us uh, to the end of this uh, example, and from here we can go back to our content. The next thing to talk about is how stellar physics plays out. Now, there's a wonderful course about this that we're not going to really go into. Uh, instead, we're going to kind of use some uh, kind of in stellar engineering formulas, which will allow us to understand the scaling between uh, different stellar properties, in particular, allowing us to use the uh, sort of mechanics of stellar evolution to predict what a system of stars will do. And the first of those approximations that we like to use is called the mass luminosity relationship. And that allows us to approximate the amount of luminosity a star has as a function of its mass. And this is the actual mass luminosity relationship here shown. Uh, these are all individual stellar models at uh, solar metallicity, so 0 0.02 uh, Met, uh, Z equals 0 0.02, uh, and that gives us this nice little uh, black dots here. And the line that you see in red is this relationship here. So it's a logarithmic relation, or it's a power law relationship, uh, which means that as the mass goes up, the luminosity goes way up. And so if I put in a 10 solar mass star here, that goes 10 to the 3.5 and a 10 solar mass star has 3,000 solar luminosities worth of energy pouring out of it every second. That gives us you know, huge scaling. The most massive stars are so geometrically more bright uh, than, uh, geometrically brighter than low mass stars. You only see high mass stars when you look at a distant system. So always remember that, that that's, you're just seeing the tip of the stellar iceberg just because the high mass stars are so uh, bright relative to their low mass companions. Now, you'll notice that there's a bit of a curvature to this, uh, and the red line isn't a perfect representation. Sometimes we'll need to care about that representation. And for that, we have a composite uh, version, which breaks up this regime, uh, or it breaks up this relationship into three kind of different regimes here at about 0.4 solar mass break, and then one up here at 10 solar masses. And that gives us uh, some different slopes and some different scaling relations where these numbers in front are selected to make sure that the relationship is nearly continuous as we go uh, through here. And to use this formula, you just find what mass range you're trying to evaluate it, and then uh, stick it in. So if it's 20 solar masses, use the bottom line. If it's seven, use the middle line. If it's 0 0.08, you would use the top line. And that just takes into account slightly different changes in the physics that's important. Now, the combination of the energy argument that we just put together and the uh, 
the mass luminosity relationship means that stars have very different stellar lifetimes. And the way we estimate that is to take the amount of energy in the fuel tank of the star uh, and decide uh, and look at the rate at which it is losing that energy. That's the mass luminosity relationship. And from that, figure out the total lifetime of the star. And the analogy here would be kind of like the fuel tank is like the fuel tank on a car or the fuel supply is the fuel, fuel tank on a car. And then the luminosity is analogous to the power of the engine or the uh, mileage of the car. And so a small low mass star is going to be more efficient. It's going to use less energy per unit time for its mass relative to a high mass star. And therefore it will be able to go a lot farther uh, in time whereas the uh, high mass stars will just consume all of their fuel incredibly quickly. Uh, it's worth noting that the all stars you have about 10% of their mass available for uh, nuclear fusion with some modest exceptions at the high mass end. Uh, the, con the practical consequences here is that high mass stars have the shortest lifetimes of about three mega years. Uh, and then all stars with masses that are less than uh, nine tenths of solar mass have not evolved off their mean sequence. So no star with this low mass has actually died in our universe yet. And that's because a one solar mass star, if we put in one for this formula, has a main sequence lifetime of almost exactly 10 billion years. And the age of the universe is thought to be about 14 billion years. So you don't have to get a lot less massive than the sun until your main sequence lifetime, which is the amount of fuel, uh, amount of time that it takes to go through the fuel, uh, that's um, going to be longer than the age of the universe. Therefore, something at that scale hasn't evolved off. Now, the next thing to talk about is uh, stellar classification and what we actually see from stars. So we talked about the basic physics of stars uh, to begin with and what a regular star has in terms of mass and luminosity. But we know that the spectra from stars actually don't look uh, like what you can sort of predict using, say, simple physics, they have a lot of stuff going on in their stellar atmospheres and their stellar photosphere. And that's what we actually observe. Now, the stellar classification scheme is something we leverage a lot in this class, and it's taking into account what we actually see, and we then connect what we see to the physical properties of stars. So we sort of put on pause the physics of stars and let's circle back and talk about what we see about stars, then let's bring those together. The stellar properties of stars as classified by their spectra show a wide variety. These are the actual flux densities of a bunch of different stars. And it's plotted, you know, so this is in F lambda units. It's arbitrarily scaled units uh, because these could be at different distances. And we pick it so that this looks nice. And this is a function of wavelength across the bottom. So our optical uh, spectrum is 400, 700 nanometers. So right around in here. And it's a logarithmic scale. So we can kind of pack more stuff on it logarithmic on the vertical axes again so we can kind of pack more stuff onto those scales so we classify stars based on their lines and if you throw your memory back to chapter one i made the point of we always make relative measurements with high per higher precision than absolute measurements and so the spectral lines in a star are a wonderful relative measurement. And it's much easier to measure the relative strength of spectral lines than it is to measure the full shape of the spectrum, even though that's what this particular plot is here. The stellar spectral types are sorted into what lines you actually see in the star. And the book goes through or the full list of all the different spectral lines, but you can kind of pay attention that these lines here that are very prominent in an A-type star are almost gone in this whatever K and M stars are. So we sort stars into a sequence, which uh, just is given a bunch of letters, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, L, T, Y. Uh, and so there's all kinds of mnemonics for memorizing this, but this is 
an effective temperature order, remembering that the effective temperature of a star is the temperature that you plug into the Stefan Boltzmann law to relate the radius, temperature, uh, and luminosity correctly. So there's L equals four pi R squared sigma T to the fourth. T is what you plug in there. And so usually you'll measure R and L and you'll get T effective L because this is not a black body spectrum, therefore you do not have a nice full relationship where you have te temperature determined by physics. This is just a number. Therefore, O stars are the hottest stars. They have the highest effective temperatures, and Y stars are the coolest stars, and they have the lowest effective temperature. The M is the coolest star, and so LTY are what we call brown dwarfs. These are failed stars that don't ever start hydrogen fusion. Uh, instead, they are kind of limited to uh, doing a little bit of deuterium fusion, maybe, uh, or sometimes no fusion whatsoever. We break up that category into uh, other... Um, we break up that category into uh, further numerical designations uh, where each spectral type is given a number, one, two, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and they're listed in numerical sequence. So an F9 star is adjacent to a G0, da, 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 up to G9, G8, G9, K0, K1, 2, 3, 4, blah, 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 K9 to M0, etc. So there's this embedded sequence all the way through uh, the stellar uh, types. So we have OBA, FG, KM, LTY. That's just vocabulary. You can write it down if it's not something that you have in the back of your head all the time. So these are the individual stellar spectra, and there's one other way we classify stars, which is to give it a luminosity designator. And a luminosity designator is given a Roman numeral. So these are comparing the A01 stars versus the A0 five stars and we distinguish the zeros uh, from or the ones from the ones by giving the luminosity class in Roman numerals and they're given an order of supergiants, giants, subgiants, dwarfs, and subdwarfs. And you might think this has something to do with the radius of the star given the names and indeed it does. The uh, supergiants have very large radii and if they have large radii that uh, tends to decrease their stellar surface gravity. So uh, an object has a force of gravity that goes like gm over r squared, bigger r, lower surface gravity. Lower surface gravity means that the pressure at the surface of the star can be lower. And if the pressure is lower, that ends up allowing the spectral lines to be a little narrower. The particles aren't moving back and forth as, fa uh, as fast, and therefore the Doppler broadening of these lines is a little smaller. So that distinguishes an A01 star from an A05 star, which are more compact and have broader lines. And you can therefore measure the surface gravity of a star by looking at the spectral lines and figuring out how broad they are. Broader lines, it's going to be a relatively small star given its spectral type. Therefore, we relate the sizes of the stars uh, to their luminosity because bigger stars at an equivalent temperature are much brighter, L equals four pi R squared sigma T to the fourth. And so while it really is a physically governed by radius property, it is actually going to lead to an observable consequence of increased luminosity. Therefore, we call these the luminosity class. Our sun, for point of contact, is a G2V or G25 star. So it's a G2 dwarf. Um, and uh, what we like to do is to look at these luminosity classes in uh, this uh, structure that we call the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And so a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is a plot of the absolute magnitude versus the spectral type of stars. And this is kind of an original OG style way of plotting uh, the stars, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, L, T, why is this forgotten? Uh, and then you can plot the absolute magnitude of the stars determined from their apparent magnitude and their parallaxes and plot that on the vertical axis with the sense that brighter stars are on top, 
uh, cooler, uh, sorry, painter stars on the bottom, and then we put them in this temperature sequence, and then the luminosity classes are just sort of sorted out into bands. Uh, Hypergiants it didn't discuss, supergiants all the way down to dwarfs and subdwarfs, and even these white dwarfs. Now, this is kind of what the original Hertzsprung and Russell diagram looked like with spectral types across the bottom. We have moved beyond this, and we usually move into a space where we actually have quantified values on these axes. Uh, absolute magnitude, plotted, but an actual Hertzsprung-Russell diagram uses numerical quantities on both axes. And this is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that we'll actually be using so much in this class. Uh, this is an observed HR diagram in units that you know about. Uh, this is a plot of the absolute magnitude in the Gaia G band compared to the color index of Gaia B versus Gaia R, BP minus RP. We'll often call that. The plot here shows the density of sources. So the sort of yellow and uh, uh, white colors here, those are high density. There's a lot of stars there. Uh, down here, there's low density stars so that even individual stars get point plotted as a single point. They, uh, so this can be uh, plotted in absolute magnitude versus color index units. And so blue hot objects are on the left and red cold objects are on the right. And you can also plot it in terms of physics units. Uh, and that's often called the theorists color, uh, yeah, theorists Hertzsprung Russell diagram, where we use luminosity on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal axis. And you'll notice that no matter how I do it, one of the axes is backwards. Uh, for the absolute magnitude uh, and color, the color magnitude diagram, as we'll call it, we see that uh, we have positive numbers uh, are at the top and negative, or, or sorry, negative numbers are at the top, positive numbers are at the bottom, and then the x-axis behaves normally. But of course, if we use physics units where these are luminosities, then it's increasing in the right direction on the horizontal axis. But then the temperature axis is backwards because a negative color index corresponds to a bluer and therefore hotter stars. And the genius of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is once you put stars into this data space, you can identify groups of them. And that's what's sort of shown here. These are subdwarfs, dwarfs, main sequence, subgiants. They're all shown here in uh, different parts of the HR diagram. It's not a filled space. Uh, there's very uh, like large gaps throughout uh, the HR diagram. Uh, and the place where the stars are and where most of them are tells you a lot about stellar evolution. So this shows uh, the... Um, general sense of what kinds of trends there are in the HR diagram. Uh, luminosity increases to the top, temperature increases going to the left, and if you combine the uh, luminosity and the temperature through the Stefan Boltzmann law, you find that small objects are in the lower left and large objects are up here in the upper right. So we're going to explore the HR diagram in a lot of detail going forward here and in the next chapter when we deal with stellar populations. Uh, so we'll come back to this a little bit more uh, later, but first we want to pivot to a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in the theorist space and talk about how stars change their uh, space as they evolve. So more on that in the next video.